My name is Sydney Smith. I'm a pastor up north. My son, Sheridan Smith, is student by president. It's great to be here. It's great to be with all of you. It's my privilege to introduce our, our speaker for chapel. And let me just say this. There's a bio that's been written, but I wanted to say this before I get into the bio. You will inevitably meet people all over, and you'll hear different speakers, and you'll hear different people share about the love of God and their love for the church. But I got to tell you, the guy you're going to hear today, I'm almost, I wouldn't guarantee you because that's probably not very godly, but I will say this. The guy you're going to hear today is going to touch your life and impact you in a way you've never been touched before, and that I can promise you. Tim Delina says that when you say yes to God, you get to go places you never went, meet people you would have never met, and do things you would have never done. So today is your opportunity to, to experience some of that. I uh, have some bio information. I really don't need this, but I want to make special note of a couple of things. Quick, quick story. Sheridan is 20, 21 now. When he was two years old, um, he would come down. And, you know, most sons emulate their fathers. And he would come downstairs in his underwear in Northern California, and he would put a little stool out, and he would say, I have something to say. And he would open his Bible, and he would start preaching. And the person he was preaching, I thought, you know, as a proud dad and son, PK, son of a preacher, that he was emulating me, but he was emulating our guest speaker today. He would say, and I told Pastor Scott, I have this on tape, someday I'll share it, I'll blackmail him. He's, he would say, and, and I told Pastor Scott, and Pastor Scott told me to ask you today. Now, he's three years old. Do you love God? And we would just, it was our, it was entertaining. I would just say, it was, it was fantastic. So I'll do this without my glasses, and then I'll bring up our speaker. Pastor Scott Hagen has been speaking professionally on leadership for over 30 years. He serves as a senior pastor at Real Life Church in Sacramento. From 97 to 2001, he was also assistant chaplain to the Sacramento Kings, and he's spoken to numerous college and pro teams. He is a frequent speaker to the U.S. Special Forces. He's been married for 34 years and has four adult children. He holds his master's degree from APU in leadership and is currently working on his Ph.D. from Gonzaga University. Scott does leadership podcasts for a little group called Jesus Culture. You might be familiar with them. So he's, you know, he's not a lightweight, I can tell you that for sure. But it gives me great pleasure, a great honor. I'm his road dog today uh, to bring up my friend, my pastor, my boss, Pastor Scott Hagen. Awesome. Thank you, Sydney. Good to see you. I can't see you, but I know you're out there. I just was among you a second ago. So I haven't been on this campus uh, for about 15 years um, here in Southern California. I've been a Northern Cal guy, but it's blessed to be here. Sheridan, proud of you. It's cr crazy. I've seen Sheridan. I was there when he was born and have watched him grow up. Uh, Sydney, great, great guy. So we've only got a few minutes to kind of build a relationship, build some level of trust um, and then be able to share some things. I hope this won't be our last time that we get opportunity to talk together. So um, I am 53. I've been married for 34 years. I got married at 19. Uh, I was in uh, Bible college at Bethany University up in Santa Cruz. Um, great university. It's closed now. And, uh, but we had a big rival with SC SCC, uh, Southern California College. I played basketball for them. We always come down here and get whooped uh, by uh, this school and then uh, kept that relationship when it became Vanguard. But I, I married 34 years and I want to show you a picture of my wife real quick. This is my wife. Um, she's beautiful. If we could bring that first slide up there, if we can. Is that first picture up? There she is right there. Uh, look at her. She got her perfect little barrette on, and her hair, and she got that little feminine wrist bent thing going on right there, her little purse. She has seen something that has swept her out to sea. 
And uh, that's the look uh, when a girl sees him, uh, when she sees him. So what is my wife, Karen Coppinger, at that time, what did she see? This is what she saw right there. Um, the next picture, please. That's who she saw right there. <laughs> and so I want to give every, every dude in here a little hope that you can win. <laughs> You, you can win a girl like that even though you look like this. So that's my little velvet twisty pants I got on there, um, my little patent leather shoes, my little freak haircut, which is actually in style now. Uh, that thing came back, and it just took about 40 years for the world to catch up to where I was at. Uh, my dad gave me that haircut. Go back to the previous. Go back to the picture of her. I mean, look at her eyes, man. She has seen him. So that's the look, guys, that you're, you're looking for in her face. Show the dude again right there. So we just want to give the guys hope one more time. Every man in here has hope right now. So Okay, so we got married when we were 19 and 20, 34 years ago. And then when a girl looks at a guy like that and uh, is swept out to see, this is usually what happens after about 30 years. And so next picture, that kind of all unfolds. So that's my beautiful wife on the right-hand side, your left. Uh, my wife, Karen. My son Tyler is right next to me. He, his wife, Nicole, is right there. She is from Chile and uh, is half Mexican, half Chilean. And her name is Nicole Medina, our, our precious Latina is what her nickname was. But she married Tyler. So Tyler and Nicole serve on our staff. My son Spencer in the middle, the tall guy, he's 6'5", 245 pounds. He was a starting tight end for the University of California, caught a pass against Ohio State two years ago, turned to the end zone at Ohio State, got a hit in the knee, Broke his leg straight back at the knee, laid his calf flat on the ground like that. Almost got his leg amputated, laid in front of 110,000 people for about 20 minutes at Ohio State. Tried to rebuild his knee. Uh, it wouldn't work. Came back for his fifth year, senior year. Practice five practices. Knee swelled up. Had to medically retire. He was headed to the NFL, man. He started his offense. Any football, football fans in here? Football fans, football fans? His starting offense was C.J. Anderson was right here uh, for the Broncos. Shane Vereen, who played for the Patriots, the Super Bowl was right here. Keenan Allen started over here uh, at the right wide receiver. Marvin Jones started over here. The other inline tight end was Richard Rodgers of the Packers. And then Spencer was the starting H-back on that offense. The problem was all that talent. We didn't have a quarterback. Our team sucked. And uh, uh, we couldn't beat UCLA, USC, any of those teams. So, But Spencer now is a football coach. He coaches inside receivers as a grad assistant at Cal. That's his beautiful wife, Brianna Collins, right in front of him right there. They're expecting their first baby. Brianna grew up in LA. She's from Church on the Way, Jack Hayford's church. Beautiful family, so Brianna Collins. So I have a Chilean daughter-in-law, African-American daughter-in-law. Then my single son, Kramer, he's between, he's on the left of uh, Spencer, because that's his sister, Jocelyn, and then her Man, right to the left. But Kramer, he's still single. I was speaking, uh, doing a, a conference up in Portland, about 3,000 Ukrainian young people from the Ukraine and Russia in Portland, Slavic youth uh, in their 20s. And I said, girls, look at him. Doesn't he look like, like a Russian czar? Look at that. He just looks like he would be beautiful. So he texts me and he goes, Dad, I got 33 friend requests on Facebook. Uh, Who's Olga? And I said, listen, I said, I don't know who Olga is, but you need to get to Portland because she's gorgeous. So get up here to Portland, man. Olga's waiting. So uh, Kramer, he, he was a quarterback, uh, signed a D1 scholarship to Portland State, played quarterback there, then transferred to Sousa Pacific. Then there's my daughter, Jocelyn. So that's my biological daughter right in front with the dark hair. And I was an idiot. I let the guy to her left do a leadership internship in our church about six years ago. He's from Brazil. Uh, he walked through the door, and I should have never let him uh, come on our staff because I said, you're a little too tall, a little too cute, a little too single. And my daughter, and his name was Marcelo, and he, he has that, he's from Brazil. So Marcelo met Jocelyn. They fell in love, got married, and he took her back to Brazil, and they live in uh, Brazil, and they passed her down there. So Anyway, that broke my heart, but it is what it is, and uh, that's my family. So this is kind of our, our big deal now. So three months ago, this happened, though, for us. Tyler and Nicole had little Elias. So we're grandparents now. That's my little dude. We've lost our minds, and we have our second grandson on the way. So that's what happens when a girl looks at a boy like that, like you saw. No matter how you start, man, in those little velvet red twisty pants, man, God can do something with your life and build a family. So anyway, that's just a little piece of who, who I am. Okay, Jeremiah 12, 5. There's a verse that I want you to remember for the rest of your life. You may forget me. You may forget this. Don't forget this. Jeremiah 12, 5 says, If you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, 
how can you compete with horses? If you stumble in a safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? So Jeremiah is prophesying to the southern kingdom of, of Judah, who did not learn the lessons of the northern kingdom of Israel, who had already been defeated by the Assyrians, and the southern part of, at that time, the divided nation of Israel was called Judah in the south, in the capital city of Jerusalem. And they, you would think that you, if you had your brother go down like that, you would think that you would really take some good notes about yourself and about life, but they didn't take good notes. They didn't pay attention. And so now they were on the precipice of defeat. The Babylonian army was mounting, was about to attack, and Jeremiah told them, tried to give them a wake-up call. And they said, man, if you think that this has been tough, it's, it's like walking or racing with people. But in the future, you're going you're gonna to have to race against horses. And if you fall down in a safe country... How are you going to do when there's real obstacles, when the thickets of the Jordan and every spring this thicket like blackberry bushes would grow some 20 feet high and 10 or 20 yards thick? Lions and different things would nest in there, animals, and they had to get through something that was a legit obstacle. So I think in this verse it talks about the nature of you, the nature of me, the nature of life, the nature of leadership is found in this little verse right here. And this is what I I wanna come and share with you today on the nature of leadership. First of all, the future will always be more demanding than the present. You don't think that when you are buried in life when you're young, trying to grind it through college. There's a little subtlety that happens in everybody's mind that if I can get through the tough part, the easy part is coming. We have a tendency, we coach ourselves up. That's how we find motivation to get through the things that are difficult, believing that there'll be a payoff in the future, and we think the payoff will be ease. But I think the nature of leadership is found in Jeremiah 12, 5, the nature of all things future. And that's this. The Bible is giving us a hint, a clue, a heads up. It's putting some popcorn through the forest, a little trail to find our way through or our way back, and it's this. He's helping us see that the future will always be more demanding than the present. So what that does to us, it doesn't, you know, discourage us or defeat us. It helps alert us that we are always in a state of preparation, transformation, and development. I get the privilege of speaking to the U.S. Special Forces. These guys are Black Hawk pilots, SEAL Team 6 guys. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal group of men and women that serve in the support structure for these, these, these units and I told them recently that, that research proves that people north of 45 that are high capacity before they're 45, that when you hit 45, if you've been high capacity, most people at 45 begin to deteriorate and no longer develop. And research will prove most people that start fast in slow. Most people that start slow in fast because fast is slow and slow is fast. And when you have a lot early, If you don't make some very calculated and critical decisions in your life, north of 45, I know which feels like a distant uh, uh, dream at this stage of life, you begin to deteriorate because people think subtly that the future will always be easier than the present. But smart leaders, wise leaders, people who get it, people who get it, understand that they are always preparing for greater demands. Sure, that there will definitely be rewards. When you do what is right, success is not scientific. If you save more money than you spend, you'll be successful. If you treat more people better than you hurt, you're going to accumulate more friends. Success is very scientific. What's not scientific is why some human beings get it and some don't. That's elusive. That's the mystery. Why don't some people get that and why do some people, it flies over their head or they reject it? So for those in this room who hope to get it, I just want you to know that as tough as life is with finals and the pressures and managing singleness and all that goes on in life, that the demands of the future, if you're successful in third grade and you pass, your reward is a tougher test in fourth grade. And if you pass fourth grade, the reward for passing the test is a tougher test. And so the demands of the future are always greater than the demands of the, of the present. Here's a second thing about the nature of leadership. All leadership begins, no, I'm sorry, go back to that slide if you can. All, all, all leadership begins with boundless love. It doesn't begin with boundaries. 
You say, what do you mean by that? This room, because we hold to Jesus as our Savior and Jesus as our model, we're about our kingdom assignment, no matter if that's in business, local church, whatever, whatever it is. It's all seamless. It all fits. It all is the same. We get in this room that everything begins with boundless love. I was talking to a young couple that's out to plant a church, and while in their, their preparation, they listed all of these rules. Our house, Tuesday nights, nobody come over. Friday nights, we protect this, protect this. We're going to protect this. And I go, dude, no one's even come yet. And you already have psyched yourself into boundaries. People need to feel the boundless love that is inside a leader's heart. And if they feel your boundless love first, they will respect the boundaries that you need to set. But if the first thing that touches people in your life is your boundaries and not boundless love, Christ in us, the hope of glory, they, they don't feel that in whatever you do, then they're going to react to your, your boundaries and you're going to come across as a rigid and cold person. Whenever somebody meets somebody who holds power and they're rigid and cold, it makes the person who's meeting them fear that they've been put into a category in the opening moments of the relationship, and it also tells them that the relationship has no future. That's the power of a powerful person coming across cold. But when you come across warm to people, it lets them know that the relationship has a future. And so this whole thing about lead, leading with boundless love, we don't lead with boundaries. Of course, there's guidelines for health, and of course, we establish boundaries. But in this world of traumatized hearts where we think every stranger is a threat, there was a day and age in this country when a stranger was a potential friend. Now we have to vet the threat before we let them in. Okay, like you're a stranger. I don't know you. I immediately assume you're a threat to me, uh, not a friend. We've completely reversed that cycle in America. And so because of that, we have millennials that are boundary-based, not boundless love based. And so that's part of the healing. You got to get that and shift that if you want to rise to a place of dramatic historic influence in this culture. It's got it's got to get inside you. Here's the third thing about leadership I want to write to give to you here this morning. This is huge. Deception never comes in the form of a contrast. It always comes in the form of a similarity. You know it's in the garden of Eden when when the two trees were identified by the creator. And he says this is the tree of life. And this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I go, God, why didn't, why didn't you just call it the devil tree? Just call it Satan's tree. Why did you have to call it by positive nomenclature? Why did you call it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Why was it pleasing to the eye, good for wisdom, good for food? Why can't it just be the Satan tree as opposed to the God tree? And matter of fact, why didn't you, why didn't you take them on a long journey into a dark forest to show them the Satan tree? Why do they have to be next to each other? You don't even have to move your head. You're always staring at two trees. And the devil comes at you in the form of one that is a substance and one that's a shadow. The devil doesn't come to us with contrasts. He comes to us with similarities. That's what's sweet, causing this generation to be swept out to sea. They can't tell the difference between the two trees. They think love is love. And you see it side by side. It's affection, it's connection, it's kindness, it's wholeness. It's, it, it sure seems like the same tree. One's a shadow, one's substance. One is death, one is life. But they're side by side, friends. So the enemy never comes at you with a contrast. He comes at you with a similarity. You know, imagine... Telling somebody, well, fruit is fruit. Fruit is not fruit. Fruit from that tree, you're going to live. Fruit from that tree, you're going to die. They're always going to be side by side. But because you are influencers in the making in this room and you long to get it, um, I believe as you go into leadership, you've got to understand the nature of leadership is that your life is always going to be presented with similarities, not contrasts. And one similarity, and there's a shadow, and one similarity is the substance. And that's where the courage is required. Okay, real quick, we got, got to fly through this. Let's go to the next. I want to give you the five marks of a multiplier. I know that sounds kind of goofy. What do you mean by that? Let me give these to you real fast. 
These are the five marks of people who are preparing to run with horses, who are preparing for real obstacles. If this is wiping you out in this culture of college, I'm telling you, friends, the demands once you leave this place, once you begin to be rewarded with the stewardship of more, it may come in the form of fame. It may, most likely, it will not. It'll come in the form of faithfulness to obscurity, but God will give you a deep satisfaction as you begin to walk out his ways. He gives you more to steward. You're successful. The demands will be greater in the future than they are in the present, okay? Don't take your eyes off the wheel. Don't have this subtle decision to become, uh, I'm gonna press into learning now so I can kind of breathe. We all breathe after tough challenges, but the reward will be a greater challenge in the future. If you can get that, your, your heart will stay alert in all that you do. So people that are gonna go the distance, I think, have five traits. If you're gonna be able to cope, lead, um, and not become a needy person, but become a producer, not a consumer, that when somebody's around you, it, it gives them energy, it doesn't burn energy. Uh, I think here's five things. Number one is this. Uh, can you endure ambiguity? which is multiple uncertainties. All leadership uh, entails this, ambiguity, not certainty. If you cannot cope, emotionally cope with ambiguity, first of all, kingdom leadership in the marketplace local church is going to be very difficult for you because there's constant loose ends. I believe this is true for anybody that moves in catalytic leadership you got to be able to endure ambiguity, things that are uncertain. If you're the kind of person that every duck is in a row, or if you need guarantees, you can't lead. Because it's filled with things that are uncertain, and there, there's multiple uncertainties constantly in leadership. And you got to be able to endure that with joy. Number two, I could break these down for 20 minutes each, but we just got to give them to you. Number two, can you influence people who are not like you? We have this whole affinity-based mindset. I've got to find my generation, my culture. I want to make a difference, and so we all dress alike. And you dress alike the way that we dress alike. We're all, every generation dresses the same. In our need to be unique, we're only unique from the previous generation, but rarely is somebody unique to their generation. So what happens is we are influencing people who are like us, but real leadership Real catalytic kingdom leadership, people who are going to race with horses are people that can influence those who are not like them. I tell young leaders all the time, I know that you reject your father's and mother's institutions, okay? You want their success. You want to write a book. You want to get on a plane. You want to be honored. You want to be invited. You want the success. You just don't want the institutions. And that's cool. Every generation has to create its new platforms. But I will tell you this. Don't blow off older people, because I told them this, and it just kind of fell out of my mouth, but it was true. Every significant door in my life has been opened up by an older person, not a peer. No peer has opened up a significant opportunity for me in my life. They gave me a chance to speak, a chance to do something with them socially, even in an event or a project, but the significant doors in my life have all been opened up by people that were older than me. So when you cut off that generation in this false pursuit of significance, uniqueness, uh, and passion, you're really killing yourself because you, you, you're cutting off numerous open doors in your life that will actually come from fathers and mothers in your life. Number, number three. Um, can you cope with complexity? Here, that's, this is different than ambiguity. Ambiguity is multiple uncertainties. Complexity is multiple realities all competing for the same space. Once you begin to lead and steward, things are gonna compete. And a leader has the ability to assign priority and value to competing realities all competing for the same space. You got three people all in need of two rooms. You got $20,000 of requests, but you've only got $6,000 in the bank account. You have to be able to cope with, which means not become depressed, disengaged, check out when you are leading and coping with uh, complexity, which is multiple realities, which is different than multiple uncertainties. And that's why so few people can run with the horses. Okay, number four. Can you make barriers disappear? 
I call this highway building. Man, I could talk, do a seminar on this today with you, but we, we won't, we've only got about five minutes here. Can you make barriers disappear? A barrier um, is something that has created an obstacle or the, the inability for access. Interstate 5 from Canada to Mexico before 1945 when they started building it was a million barbed wire fences. Can you imagine walking from Canada to Mexico down I-5? Every 20 steps, you're over barbed wire, climbing over a fence in a ditch. People that build highways simply remove barriers. Leadership, catalytic leadership, people that run with horses, okay? People who prepare themselves are learning the skill sets of how to be highway builders, how to make barriers disappear between generations, between people, between culture. You gotta be able to do that. And the last thing real fast is this. Do you have the ability to live diplomatic? Can you move from enmity to harmony in your relationships? Can you be a peacemaker, not just a peacekeeper? Can you literally do more than kick the can down the street? Can you literally take people who are adversarial and make them into teammates? People that have held worldviews that are deeply entrenched. Can you be diplomatic and not lose your cool? Remember, when you scream at somebody, it'll take them five years to forget that image of you. If you lie to somebody, it'll take them 10 years to forget you're a liar. It takes, takes them five years to forget that you, you yelled at them. That's if you want to write that check. So you have got to be diplomatic in how you move people from enmity to harmony. Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. I just want to give this to you in, in, as fast as we can. Uh, books are the last thing you bring to a college campus. I didn't even bring them. Uh, I just recently was able, with uh, the guys at Jesus Culture designed this. I've been, I have a social media site with about 100,000 people on it. It's called Note to Leaders. It's kind of a dopey name. It's a Facebook site. Um, we started posting this. I have 30,000 English-speaking Muslims from the Middle East out of the 100,000 are on this site. We talk leadership every day. It's just free leadership. Um, and so we took the five, top 500 of the last 1,500 and we put it into an anthology, a book that is 500 original discussion starters on virtue-based leadership. It's called The Language of Influence. I know you're not in the mood to get another book, but when you do get in the mood down the road, you can find that on Amazon, The Language of Influence. So here's, I'm gonna give you five of them real fast and we're gonna pray. Even if you were born for, oh, go back, go back, go back. Go back, this is the best one for millennials. Even if you were born for something, you still have to learn how to do it. You gotta learn how to do it. Like, well, that's not my passion, my talent, my gifting, uh, uh, my destiny. I don't care what it is, you still gotta learn how to do it even if you were born to do it. You can't just sit around and wait for that mystical revelation of what you were born to do and suddenly it all kicks into gear. You gotta learn how to do the things that you were born to do. Number two, there are two types of leaders, those who love power and those who love people. You can create two buckets. I can, I, when I'm around somebody, they have a dominant circle. Either they love power or they love people. Be the leader who loves people. Number three, criticizing someone is how the underachiever compliments himself. When you rip somebody, you are bleeding your insecurity. And you are, in a way, trying to self-compliment by criticism of someone else. So when I, when I hear somebody criticize, I can go, that's an underachiever trying to feel good about themselves because they're ripping the world around them. Number four, we got 120 seconds. I already mentioned this. If you need guarantees, you cannot lead. There's too much ambiguity and complexity. Number five, I think there's five or six here. Put the next one up. It's never about your passion alone. It's far more about your capacity to draw out unscripted passion in others. People trying to find their passion, refine their passion. They get up and stand up. I need everybody to sit still and watch me do my passion. It's not leadership. Passion is about drawing out the unscripted passion of other people, not simply displaying your passion in front of a group of people who've been told to sit and watch you. You gotta bring it out on other people. Okay, one more. I think the last one is here, yeah. Very simple, and then I'm, then I'm done. The secret to longevity is simple. Don't self-destruct. Devil can't take you out. People can't take you out. People take themselves out because they self-destruct. That's why they never make it to a state of longevity or convergence in their leadership. And lastly, insecurity will emotionally rearrange everything you see 
and here as a leader. So maybe we'll come back and talk more about that. Let's all stand up together. We're going to pray together. I know that was a fire hose, fast and furious. Jeremiah 12, 5 says, if you've raced or walked with men and you've, they've worn you out, how are you going to race with horses? If you've fallen down in a safe country, how are you going to make it through the thickets of the Jordan? There's real demands and real obstacles, but you are high capacity. Your generation is the first generation to take a bullet in the forehead on American soil for their faith. Millennials up in Oregon, right down the line, are you a Christian? Yes. Are you a Christian? No. Shot in the leg. You a Christian? Yes. My generation has never died as martyrs for the Christian faith. The millennials, you in this room have taught the Christian church in America how to die for your faith. I commend you. I put a gold medal around your neck. There's great things in store. God bless us. Pray, Jesus, we just pray blessing, Lord. I pray some of the seeds that were shared, Lord, would last and they would remain. Father, I praise you and thank you for new friendships, new relationships, God. Lord, I thank you that everybody in this room, God, young and old, God, teach us how to race with horses, God. Don't let the demands of the future, Lord, take us out. Father, we give you praise and honor and glory. Hey, let's find each other on Twitter. If you go to Scott Hagen Leads, S-C-O-T-T-H-A-G-A-N Leads on Twitter, Facebook, we'll find each other. God bless everybody. Thank you for coming today. At Vanguard University, your story matters. Where will it take you next? For more information, please visit vanguard.edu.